Well, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. The sound is good. You hear me well? Yes, yes it's perfect. Thank yeah, you. Okay, great, great. So, um, well, thanks for having me in this virtual symposium. Um, I, I could catch only the last two conferences uh, by the students. It was very interesting. Unfortunately, I, I missed the first one. Uh, great, great job to all of you. So what I'm going to present is actually a multi-step project that has uh, multiple components and we will mostly focus our discussion on what was financed by the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. But first, I need to introduce you to the whole concept of the device. I have nothing to disclose. Okay, so this really is a teamwork. Uh, I need to mention from the get-go that the initial idea was actually from my research assistant, Gabriel Charret, who did his PhD in radiobiology uh, in, uh, and with, with my lab on brain tumor uh, research. Uh, and I, I, I will specify a bit later what was his idea. You'll see it's, at the, it's really at the heart of this device we're trying to build. Brigitte Guérin is our, is our uh, radiation expert. Laurence Derry is uh, the leading PhD student on this project. And Marshall Akbari is uh, a bioengineer working at Victoria University, who is uh, our main collaborator for the device itself. So uh, the presentation will go as follows. I will first discuss the major hurdles from our point of view in the treatment of uh, malignant primary brain tumors to better introduce the uh, overall concept of the device, which we call GlioTrap. I will show preliminary results of GlioTrap. And finally, I will discuss uh, preliminary results with the radio is isotope, which is the component really financed by the Brain Tumor Foundation. Okay, so from our point of view, there are three main problems limiting the treatment of primary brain tumors. And I think most of you will agree with these three problems. The first one has to do with tumor heterogeneity and that we know that within a given tumor, there are different tumor cell types, including uh, uh, stem cells. And uh, a magic bullet approach, uh, meaning targeting specifically one uh, target is unlikely to succeed. Problem number two is a very frustrating problem uh, to the surgeons that we are. I saw that. Joe is, uh, is present and he will acknowledge this frustration with me in that we have uh, tumors that we take out, we look at the MRI post-op post and we're very happy with our resection, but uh, deep in our heart, we know that there's a lot of tumor cells left behind that we don't actually see on the MRI and that the tumor will recur. And the third, uh, the third problem has been alluded by the, the students presenting from Western, uh, the presence of the blood-brain barrier that actually limits therapeutics entry. For, for those of you who knows me, you know that it is a, um, it has been a consideration along my career. My lab actually works on breaching the blood-brain barrier, but the project I'm going to present this morning is a different way to bypass the blood-brain barrier. Here comes GlioTrap. So GlioTrap is a multi-pronged local regional therapeutic device. Uh, Gabriel, which had the initial idea, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, actually asked a very naive question in that instead of trying to block the migration of glial tumor cells, why don't we use this migrational capacity to our advantage and try to lure the tumor cells within a trap? He initially wanted to name the device Aglaofem. So for those of you that are familiar with Greek mythology, Aglaofem is the name of one of the sirens, which had a very lambent voice that could lure the sailors toward our trap. But we uh, thought it was a little too prosaic, so we went with Gliotrap. So Gliotrap would be a device inserted at the time of reoperation once the tumor relapsed. That's the initial design anyway that would have the capacity to attract glial uh, tumor cells toward a contained volume. Now, within this volume, we would hit the trapped glial tumor cells via a massive local regional multi-pronged therapy. And when I say massive, I insist on the word and that it would be a combination of uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, with doses that would surpass what is required to uh, bypass all the resistance mechanism. 
This would obviously be in a limited and controlled volumetric, volumetric distribution to uh, limit the side effects. So uh, you see the five steps in the design of our gel. We have already designed the gel. We have already uh, completed all the steps for the chemo attraction. Now we are actively working on the chemotherapy, but mostly on the radiotherapy component. And once all of these parts, if you will, are uh, fine-tuned, we will integrate them into a whole device that we plan to test in an animal with a large brain, such as either a dog or a pig. So uh, the uh, Brain Tumor Foundation grant actually pertains to the radiotherapy component of, uh, of the project. And most of my discussion will present preliminary, preliminary results with this component of the device. But let, let me first uh, explain uh, what we have done so far in terms of work. So the, 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 the biogel has been designed by Martian which uh, actually Martian had already designed biomaterials for clinical use. We, we simply uh, work with him in collaboration and modify his biogel for our purpose. So the biogel has then been applied to test our um, chemo attraction. And for the chemo attraction, we did select three different molecules. We did a, a full uh, review of literature looking for uh, molecules that would have the capacity to chemo attract different glial tumor cells. So, so, so molecules that have been described to have this capacity to attract uh, glial tumor cells in different cell lines uh, without having other phenotypic um, uh, influence such as uh, tumor growth. So mostly chemo attraction. So we tested CXCL10, CCL2, and CCL11. Now everything I'm going to show you are figures that are extracted from this paper, which is uh, in, um, in publication right now. So uh, the first figure I'm going to show you, I, have a, I don't see all my, uh, my screen, but anyway. It's a very crowded figure. So, so if you look at the upper row, you have the F98 cells, whereas the lower row interests the U87 cells. On the left panel, you see what we call the agarose drop test, which is simply an agarose drop containing either the chemoattractant or control, so nothing at all. And we played a pre, pre, uh, petri dish with uh, the relevant tumor cells. And we simply uh, compare whether the control condition was different to the chemoattractant. Uh, we divided each, uh, each of these experiments in four different zones. So zone zero is within the drop, whereas zone one is close to the drop. And, and as you get further away from the drop, you have zone two and three. And we simply did tumor cell counts. So you have the results here in the uh, green panel. And what you can uh, appreciate is that within zone zero and zone one, there is quite a significant increase in tumor cell accumulation compared to the control conditions. And as you get along zone two and three, this, uh, these, uh, these uh, measurements uh, get lower and the influence we get with the chemoattractant uh, gets lower as well. I'm showing only result, result with CXCL10 because it was our... Uh, our uh, major player, if you will, the one that gave us the best results. So the next step was to test this in vivo. And to do that, we went along with our uh, well-characterized Fisher F98 glioma tumor model. We've been using this model for greater than 15 years now. It's highly predictable, highly reliable. We can deliver radiation to our animals. We can deliver chemo. We can open the blood-brain barrier within the animal inserted in the gantry and test this opening of the barrier. So it's a ve very good model, but there was one aspect missing to the model and the grant by the Brain Tumor Foundation allowed us to finally uh, take care of that. So now we're doing to get as close as possible to the clinic, a partial resection of our tumor. So that's the first step we uh, undertook when we got the grant. We've been trying to design such an approach for a couple of years now, but we concentrated our effort and Gabrielle and Laurence did design a way to remove part of the tumor. 
So the way it works is we insert the tumor, we wait for 10 days, and we get along with this device, which is a modified needle that can aspirate a certain volume of the tumor, which seems fairly consistent across the 12 animals we tested. And once this is done, well, we can undertake our experiments with the gliogel. So from now on, all the animal experiments I'm, I'm gonna show under, underwent a partial tumor resection prior to the, uh, uh, to the experiments. And so, just so you know, this, we're, we're prepping this manuscript. It's gonna be the first manuscript derived from this uh, grant we received from the Brain Tumor Foundation. So here you have to stick with me. Once again, a crowded panel. So different data on this figure. Um, in A, you see two different tumor samples uh, that display very well the two different experiments we did. So what we did here is we first, in this first sample, we first implanted the tumor on the right side, and we waited for 10 days and implanted our gliogel with the chemoattractant in the other hemisphere. So everything you see appearing in blue has to do with this first manipulation. The idea here was actually to measure whether the implantation of the geogel in the contralateral hemisphere had the potency to lure tumor cells away from the main tumor nodule. And you see the results here. So you have the control uh, condition and the different chemoattractants here. And you see that there is a significant increase in the number of tumor clusters away from the main tumor nodule. So what we did is we counted all the tumor clusters that were not in direct contact with the tumor nodules. So you see in this uh, condition, in this, con in this uh, type of experiments, we had eight animals and we had an average of 72 tumor cluster. And in the other set of experiment, what we did is we implanted the gel, waited for 10 days, and went on to retrieve part of the tumor and implant the gliogel within the tumor. So the idea here was to show that implanting the gel within the tumor would limit the spreading of brain tumor cells outside of the main tumor nodule. And this is what we obtained. Once again, you see the count. So the peripheral cell cluster counts here was six. You see that uh, except for control condition, there is quite a uh, significant decrease, especially for CXCL10. CL and when you look at the last panel in E, in red here, we control actually, we simply compare the contralateral to the ipsilateral uh, implantation of the gliogel with the uh, chemoattractant to show you the discrepancy between both set of experiments and show you that it appears to work fairly well. And both control conditions are fairly similar. So on to the main project financed by the Brain Tumor Foundation. We had to, the, the next step was to find our radio isotope and try to experiment with it. Everything I'm gonna show you is a preliminary work. Uh, our work was slowed a bit by the uh, pandemic, as I'm sure uh, you're aware. Uh, and I'm sure you've been hit by the same problem back home. But in any rate, so we chose the uh, uh, Copper 64 as a radio isotope. It was mostly Dr. Guerre's choice because of the very short half-flight, which, which was good for us, but mostly because of the very steep drop-off, which allows us to have a controlled deposition of the radiation uh, within the extent of our resection cavity. And also because of the fact that it is a teramnostic agent, so it allows us to treat and also to follow the tumor uh, while we uh, follow our subjects. So the first step was to ensure that the thing was safe so that we could insert the copper 64 within the gliogel and that the radioisotope would remain within the gliogel. So the first thing we did is a TLC bioscan looking at uh, samples at room temperature and at 37 degrees over time. So you see here zero hour to 141 hours. And we look at the, the, the spread, if you will, of the uh, radiation emission. And it was considered within safety margins, within the uh, margin error. So it, it went from 14 millimeters up to 25 here, and at 37 from 12 millimeters to 16 millimeters. And we confirmed that with auto, auto uh, radiography results, which show that there was 
there was no apparent leakage of our gel uh, outside of the uh, of, of the radio isotope outside of the gel. So this is this is the gel that was deposited within agarose and with auto radiography and day zero, day one, and day two. And although you see the decay in radiation emitting as we would uh, expect, the, the, the area of radiation emitting remained about the same. The next step was to calculate the, the actual dose. Um, and the, the dose was actually extrapolated by work by Tse and al. Uh, we, uh, we, you have to understand that what we calculate when we look at the uh, radioisotope is actually the uh, emission of radiation, but that's not what we're interested in. We're mostly interested in the radiation absorption within the brain. So we need to understand what is the equivalent dose in uh, megabecquerel that will allow us to have the radiation absorption we're looking for. So we went on with an estimate that we wanted 100 gray at the immediate periphery of the, the margin. And based on these uh, uh, estimates, uh, we found that a dose of 0.026 megabecquerel of uh, copper 64 would be ideal for our experiments. So that's the initial dose we chose to work with. To be safe, to be on the safe side and to compare the results with our benchmark, which is gamma knife irradiation, uh, we compared this uh, procedure with uh, gamma knife delivered to our uh, Fisher F98 model. Now this has been uh, ongoing for many years now. Gabriel, uh, actually did his PhD uh, on the subject and designed a tailor-made um, uh, a, a tailor apparatus uh, to secure the animals within the gamma knife that allows us to deliver very constant and regular radiation doses to the tumor. So we used this uh, comparison uh, with uh, radiochromic films to study the dose deposition with copper 64 compared to gamma knife use. And what we found is actually we had uh, severely um, un underestimated the dose, uh, we uh, overestimated the dose we use. So we are in the process of increasing the dose of copper 64 that we incorporate in the gel to get the equivalent uh, dose in gray. So the equivalent uh, dose deposition we wish to obtain uh, with the uh, radio isotope. That being said, we have started to experiment with animals. We have only four animals done thus far, but we have four animals that underwent the tumor implantation at day zero, followed by tumor resection at day 10 and geogel insertion with the uh, copper 64 with the initial dose plan of 0.026 megabecquerel. Uh, and you, we, we've been following these animals up to 30 days and sacrificing them at 30 days to harvest brains and study uh, the uh, area of tumor, the area of the tumor, the area of inoculation of the gel and the periphery as well. And we, you see that we can follow these animals with uh, PET scans. So I, I showed you two PET scans here, number one and two at time zero. So right after the insertion, and at 24 hours, that shows the decay in radiation. So at 24 hours, we are 25% of the dose left. So you see that there's a decrease, a significant decrease in the emission, but the overall um, area of radiation appears to be uh, identical. So this is very preliminary results. Uh, we can see that the surgical technique has been refined and is now routinely used. So we're very happy about that. This complement nicely our model. Uh, we have chosen copper 64 because it displays a very steep drop off. It is terraniastic and it has a very short half-life. We are now in the process of defining the optimal dose. We thought we were done with that, but we're not. We hope to be complete by December, 2021. And then we'll take part, we will proceed with the final step, which is the whole insertion of the gel with copper 64 uh, in the animals and different groups with different dose to study survival and quality of life. So I'm done. I'll be happy to take questions if there are any. 
Um, Thank you very much. That was incredible.